Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the degree of a field extension and the Tower Law. Okay, right, so we were in the process of doing an example. So we said that we were going to use the rational numbers as our smaller field, and we were going to use uh, the uh, set of all things of the form a plus b the square root of 2, where a and b uh, are both elements of the rational numbers as our bigger field, okay? And this bigger field contains the rational numbers, therefore, uh, there is a field extension between the two, basically. So, L is a field extension of K, um, so we have this field extension. In the intuitive sense, L is a field extension of K. In the rigorous sense, uh, the field extension clearly consists of uh, a monomorphism between the two, along with the two uh, fields. Okay, right. Uh, so, we now want to work out what is the degree of this field extension, and for that we need a basis of this um, larger field, where we now view this as a vector space over this smaller field. Now, what is the basis of a vector space? Well, basically, the basis of a vector space is a set of elements from this vector space. Okay, so you need some vectors, v1, v2, etc., um, in this set, and they have to obey two properties. Firstly, they need to span the set, uh, they need to span the entire vector space. Okay, and what that means is that any element within the vector space, so let's say uh, x is an element within the vector space, any arbitrary element within the vector space can be written as a linear combination of these basis elements, basically. So, you can take, so what it means is, for all x is an element of our vector space, which is L, uh, there exist numbers in the field, okay? So there exist numbers A1, and I'm going to have to now give some finite uh, number for this uh, basis. So let's say the basis goes up to Vn, where n is some uh, finite positive integer. And basis basises don't always have to be finite, but for the basis of this, at least, we'll say they are finite. Okay, so, um, basically it means that there must exist some elements of this field, and we'll call this A1, A2, all the way up to An. Okay, and these are all just numbers within this field K, such that X can be expressed as A1 times V1 plus A2 times V2 plus all the way up to An times Vn. So basically, you have to be able to find a certain combination of coefficients that you can stick in front of the basis elements and then add them together like this. And this is called a linear combination. There needs to exist a linear combination of the basis elements uh, such that uh, you can create any vector within this, um, within this vector space. So you need to be able to create any vector within the base uh, vector space by taking linear combinations of the basis elements. So these numbers can vary basically, these are not fixed, you can make these equal to whatever you like in K, but you must be able to find a combination of these such that you can get any element within the field, uh, sorry, within the vector space basically. That's what it means to span the vector space. Okay, uh, now there's another property that you need, which is linear independence. Okay, and basically this states that the only solution to a certain equation is for all of the coefficients to be equal to zero. So basically, if I want a solution to this equation, a1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus all the way up to a n v n, is equal to the zero vector. So remember, there is a zero vector in a vector space, which is basically the additive identity uh, for the abelian groups. Remember, vector spaces were f fundamentally abelian groups, so there is an additive identity there. And the only way for you to create the additive identity by taking a linear combination of these, um, these basis vectors has to be if all of these 
um, coefficients, which remember are from the scalar field, if all of them are equal to the additive identity within that scalar field, basically. Okay, that's the criterion for linear independence. Right, so there is a very obvious basis for uh, our vector space L over our uh, smaller field K. Okay, which is the basis, the vector 1 within this set, and also the vector the square root of 2. Okay, now why is this a basis? Well, firstly, because we can create any vector within the set by taking linear combinations of it. So we can create a1 times 1 plus a2 times the square root of 2, um, and a1 and a2 can vary over any element in the rational, so hopefully it's clear that I can then get to any element in this entire vector space via this means. Because if you give me any arbitrary vector in the vector space, a plus b the square root of 2, all I have to do is set a1 to a, um, so I need to make these two equal, and all I have to do is set a2 equal to b, and then I've instantly got you that vector, so it spans, that's fine. And then we also need to prove linear independence. So we need to prove that the only solution to this equation is if all of the coefficients are equal to zero, i.e. a1 and a2 have to be equal to zero. But that, again, is hopefully obvious, because if a1 is non-zero, then this first number in front of 1 is going to be non-zero. Uh, and even if a2 is then equal to 0, this, it, there's still no way that this is going to equal 0, basically. And no number that you can put here will possibly ever make it equal to um, the uh, 0 element within the uh, vector space, okay? So as long as these two are non-zero, you can't possibly have this equal to the um, additive identity element. I hope you can appreciate that. It's pretty trivial, basically. Okay, right, uh, so um, it is also linearly independent. Okay, so we have a basis, it consists of two elements, therefore you would say that the degree of the field extension L over K is equal to 2. Okay, so we're now going to prove something that is called the Tower Law for field extensions, and this is going to be horrendously powerful, and this really is why uh, the concept of a, the degree of a field extension is so powerful, because it's going to obey the Tower Law. Okay, so what does the Tower Law say? Basically, the Tower Law says that if you have Two, well, if you have three fields, okay, so if you have a field K, okay, which is inside of a field L, okay, and L itself is inside of a bigger field M, so the biggest field is the field M, within the field M you have a smaller field L, and within the smaller field L is a smaller field K, it's like that dratted story or dratted song. There was a dark, dark room, and in the dark, dark room there was a dark, dark box, and in the dark, dark box, so uh, yes, it's like that. Okay, so um, in the um, inside the field M, there is a smaller field L, and inside this field L, there is a smaller field K, which means that we have two field extensions. Well, in fact, we have three, potentially. But um, if we look at the field extension M over L, Okay, we can take the degree of the field extension of M over L. Okay, so that's the degree of this field extension here. We can also look at the field extension of L over K, and we can take the degree of the field extension of L over K. We can also look at K as being a subfield of M, and therefore we can look at the degree of the field extension of M over K. Now, basically, the Tower Law is that if you want the degree of the field extension of M over K, it's equal to the degree of the field extension of M over L, so the degree of this field extension, times the degree of the field extension of L over K. Okay, and you will not believe how powerful this law is. Okay, so let's begin with the proof of this law. Okay, so, because that's the best way to gain intuition for uh, this law, to see how it's proved. Okay, right. So, let's initially assume that um, these two field extensions here, the field extension of L over K and the field extension of L over 
oh, sorry, the, the field extension of L over K and the field extension of M over L, let's assume that they are both finite degree. So let's assume that the field extension of M over L is, let's say, little m here. And let's say that the, field, the degree of the field extension of L over K is some little m. Okay, so our aim is to now prove that the degree of this field extension of m over k is then equal to m times n. Okay, right. So, firstly, if we're thinking about this field extension of m over l, then there must have been some set of basis elements within the uh, vector space m, such that they uh, were a basis for m over the scalar field L. Okay, so let's call this set of basis elements uh, x1, x2. Now, how many of them must we have had? Well, the degree of the field extension, remember, is the number of basis elements. Therefore, we must have had m basis elements. So let's say these are the basis elements of uh, the vector space m when we are viewing it as a being a vector space over L. Okay, so all of these uh, elements here, x1, x2, all the way up to xm, they are just elements of this big vector space m. They are not necessarily elements of the uh, scalar field L, okay? So they're elements within m. And basically, you can get any element of m by taking a linear combination of these basis elements where uh, the coefficients are within the scalar field L. Okay, now the same thing applies for this field extension of L over K. Again, we can write the vector space L as, um, well, we can form a basis for the vector space L over K, basically. So we can write any element of L uh, in terms of linear combinations of a set of basis elements where the coefficients of these linear combinations will be in the set K. Okay, so let's call this set of basis elements, which now are all in L. We'll call them y1, y2, and how many of these are we going to have? Well, we're going to have n, since the degree of that field extension was n. So it will go all the way up to yn there. Okay, and all of these, y1, y2, and sorry, I put yi there, that was just meant to be y1, uh, all the way up to yn, these are all in the uh, field L. Okay, uh, or you should view it as a vector space, clearly, since we were talking about the um, uh, field extension of L over K, or the vector space of L over K. Right, so, now, what we're going to do is we're going to multiply these elements together, basically. Okay, so if all of these elements here, Y1, Y2, Yn, if they are in L, then L is a subset of M. So they are certainly within M, basically. So all of these elements here are within M. All of these elements are within M. M is a great field. So we can multiply elements together. So I want to create a new set here. Okay, so I want to create the set uh, YJXI, basically, where all of these um are, well, where you take all combinations, basically. So i is going to vary between 1 and uh, little m, and j is now going to vary between 1 and a little n, like so. So basically, I'm going to take every possible combination you can think of. So we'll start off with, let's say, i is equal to 1. So we'll fix this i as 1. And then we'll let j vary over 1 to n, basically. So we'll put in y1 here. So we'll get the answer y1, x1. And that will be some element within m. OK. We'll then let j equal 2. We'll get y2, x1. That will be some element in m. We'll continue on all the way down to yn times x1. That will be some element in m. Then we'll progress forward to i is equal to 2, and then we'll let j vary over all of these again, create a whole n elements for x is equal to 2, and then we'll progress on through x, uh, n, basically. And overall, in this set, then, uh, there will be m times n elements. Now, you might be able to guess what I'm going to claim. My claim is that this is going to be a basis, okay, for the vector space of m, okay, over k. 
So, if I want to examine the field extension of m over k, if I want to work out what the degree of the field extension of m over k is, what I need to do is view uh, the field m as being a vector space over uh, the scalar field k, and I need to work out a basis for that, and I need to work out how many basis elements there are in there. So, my claim is that this is a basis for uh, that vector space m over k. Okay, and now what I need to do is prove that to you. I need to prove that it spans uh, the set M, i.e. if I take linear combinations of this set um, where the coefficients are within this scalar field K, then I can get you any element of the set M. And I also need to prove that it's linearly independent, i.e. that the only way that I can take a linear combination of these elements and get the zero ele vector uh, in the set n. It's basically if all the coefficients are the uh, additive identity within the scalar field k. Okay, and we'll continue this proof in the next video.